Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is real estate investment expert, David Robinson. Uh, David is the CEO and principal broker of Canovo Group, a boutique real estate investment and brokerage firm located in Utah. David is an active investor, broker, and podcast host, and has been directly involved in over 250 million in real estate transactions. He has led a top producing real estate sales team and managed a leading national franchise brokerage. At Canovo Group, David oversees all marketing, asset valuations, negotiations, and transaction management for the brokerage. So guys, I'm excited to get on to the show with David. Before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items. I want to remind you of how to get a free copy of my recently released best-selling book, The Cashflow Investor, How to Create Financial Freedom Investing in Commercial Real Estate. You can either go buy a copy on Amazon for $20, and all the profits do go to two great charities, so you can do that. But I'm also, I've also made a free PDF version available for my loyal listeners here. And so you can go over to kevinbupp.com forward slash free book to grab that copy. Again, that's kevinbupp.com forward slash a free book. Uh, moving on here, just um, want to give you guys an update. You know, as far as, uh, you know, I always folks that reach out, ask them about opportunities, partnership deals, uh, you know, just kind of what we have working behind the scenes. So, you know, we've always, we're always out buying deals. I mean, that's what we do. We're an investment firm. I, you know, I always like to call this podcast kind of my side gig. And so, you know, Sunrise Capital Investors is our investment arm. And, you know, we're actively purchasing mobile home parks and parking assets, as well as uh, we've got a few build to rent projects happening in Phoenix, Arizona. And so if you guys have an interest in, in working with us and uh, you know partnering with us on, on existing opportunities that we have in our pipeline, I just tied up a class A parking asset in D in one of the hottest neighborhoods in Washington, DC. It's literally walking distance to the white house. And uh, was just up there a couple of weeks ago doing due diligence. And um, you know, ultimately we're, uh, we're partnering with a number of our limited partners uh, to to take that deal down, and we've got about 60 million of other assets in contract at present time, a mixture of mobile home parks as well as parking assets and, and just key markets. And so just our deal flow has really kicked up over the last few months. And so if you want to see about investing with us and some of the opportunities we have available, go over to investwithsunrise.com. Again, that's investwithsunrise.com. And with that, guys, I'd like to welcome our guest for today's show, David Robinson. David, how's it going, my friend? Doing great, Kevin. How are you? Oh, man, I'm doing awesome, man. Couldn't be better and even better that you're here with me today. So we're going to talk everything and anything related to real estate. So what I'd like to do, David, uh, for those that aren't familiar with you, that don't know you, your background, your story, take a few moments. I gave you that very brief introduction, but I'm sure there's a lot more to it. And so tell us you know, who you are and ultimately what it is you do. Yeah, the short version is uh, I have been in the real estate world for roughly 18 years now. Uh, started out on the residential brokerage side of the business, um, built up a team that focused exclusively on short sales and foreclosure prevention in the run up through the 2008, uh, 2009 recession. As that started to transition, ended up pivoting my team to a traditional residential resale brokerage. Uh, ultimately was recruited to run a uh, national franchise uh, brokerage here locally in Salt Lake City, Utah, and ran both my team and the real estate brokerage for a bit. Ultimately uh, realized after about a decade in the business that I hadn't done nearly enough on the investing side of the business. It's a trap that a lot of real estate agents and brokers get into where they don't actually uh, invest in real estate the way that they should being on the front lines of, of seeing opportunities. Yeah. And so I was one of those and uh, had a moment in time where uh, life circumstance, had my dad that got really sick, made me really reflect on what I had done and where I was going and where I was at financially and ultimately made a big pivot in my business, shut everything down and ultimately uh, started a small boutique brokerage that was exclusively focused on serving multifamily investors who are looking to buy small scale multifamily property for their own personal portfolios. And uh, that's the brokerage that I run today. And over the last two years have uh, uh, added another, um, another aspect of my business on the real estate syndication side. And we're happy to go into any of that. Okay. No, no, I appreciate that. And talk to me about the, I guess, really two points I want to hit on here. Um, and I guess the first one being really the, the decision uh, to take the path to really open up a, a, a boutique, more of a boutique 
type brokerage focusing on smaller multifamily assets. What really drove you in that direction? Well, I knew that I needed to get uh, in closer proximity to investment property. When you're in the real estate brokerage space, it's very transactional. Um, it's uh, uh, what I mean, uh, the residential brokerage space. It's just very transactional. It's, it's, it's a small business. It's really not even focused on investing or even real estate. It's just a service-based business. And what I needed to do was get in closer proximity to investment property to be able to achieve what I wanted to achieve, which was put myself and my family in a better uh, position from a wealth standpoint and also a cash flow standpoint. And so making that pivot, I knew would force me, it was an adjacent pivot, right? I was already in the business of real estate, but I didn't necessarily want to go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and have cash flow issues or challenges or whatever it might be. So a small pivot to boutique brokerage focused on working exclusively with investors allowed me to sort of navigate this fence or, or straddle the fence between income producing activities and also investing. Got it. No, that makes sense. And let's talk about that first deal. So you, you, you kind of had a, a light bulb moment to where you realized that you spent a decade making great money, but not necessarily reinvesting it. And it, it's, you make a good point that there, you know, I, I know a few top brokers um, in the commercial world that, you know, easily make more than a million dollars a year. And uh, um, they have very minimal, if any investments in any commercial real estate assets. And it's just, it's mind boggling to me that ultimately, you know, every deal you start over again, you might be making great money, you know, great commissions, but every deal, every January 1st, you start over again. Right. And, uh, uh, you get to see your clients buying these assets. You also get to see your clients selling these assets, maybe a few years later, if they're, if they're turning a deal, um, and you get to see the type of profits that they make for taking that, that, uh, that, 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 that risk there and in, in investing, but, um, but yeah, some, some just never really, some never get the memo and they don't read the memo. I'm it's not unfortunate. Sure. <laughs> and I think a lot of people would be surprised at how many people fall into that trap. So yeah, yeah it, it can be a challenge for so a lot of talk, brokers let, and agents. Let's talk about the first deal. Uh, that's always the, right. you know, the foundation. Let's talk about that first deal that you invested in. Uh, what was the opportunity? What excited you about it? And ultimately how did it look on the back end once you put forth the business plan? So the very first deal, and granted, I had done some uh, some single family stuff, but nothing mm -hmm. significant, right? So some fix and flips and and some other JV deals, but uh, nothing significant. So my very my first real significant investment opportunity came in the form of marketing to direct to owner small multifamily property, and uh, I went in approaching it as an investor, not as a broker. Um, I targeted a particular type of property, so I wanted something over twelve units. Uh, roughly a million dollars or more. And, um, and I was looking for a C-class asset that had some value add. Mm -hmm. And I actually uh, connected with the owner through direct mail. And uh, she contacted me uh, initially and expressed some interest in selling. I made a low ball offer or, you know, uh, it, was a, it was a fair offer, but it was definitely low. And she, you know, kindly rejected it and then said she wouldn't you know consider it but i stayed in touch with her and i sweetened my offer over time ultimately uh we ended up getting that it was a 14 unit 1970s construction late 1960s construction uh two bed typical two bed one bath um 14 unit apartment building and 800 square feet roughly average unit size and i got it under contract for 1.2 million and uh I, I put it under contract knowing that I didn't have a ton of experience in the commercial multifamily space yet. And I knew I was going to bring on partners. I had done a pretty good job of building up a network of other like-minded multifamily investors. And so I had plenty of people to choose from. And when I selected this opportunity, 1.2 million after doing some due diligence on the deal and ultimately going into it, I, I mean, 1.2 wasn't an exciting uh, price point. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like it was doable and I felt like there was a, a there was, it, it could work, but it wasn't exciting. I mean, the cash flow was minimal. Um, I felt like that there was definitely some upside, but it wasn't my ideal opportunity as a new investor, but I knew that I had a partner or a couple potential partners that this would be the perfect opportunity for. They owned other stuff similar to that. Ultimately went through the due diligence process, brought two partners in who brought the vast majority of the equity to the table. Uh, we joint ventured on the deal and uh, acquired the property. And I took the deal, I took my ownership in the deal 
as a tenant in common because I knew I wasn't going to stay in that deal for too long. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to exit it and probably get a better return than what my partners were willing to accept on this particular asset. It was perfect for them because they owned other stuff very similar to it in the area. They had a, a property management company that manages this asset mm -hmm. all the time. Long story short, uh, we bought it, we managed it, and ultimately I exited that deal uh, and moved on to another opportunity uh, within a year after uh, buying the property. Got it. Got it. Okay. Fantastic. I appreciate you sharing that with us. And, you know, I know there's, you know, there was a, a, we were talking about it before we, before we went live here about, um, you know, you've got your boutique brokerage firm and, and a lot of your clients, you know, they're looking, you know, they're investors and they're looking for rental property. And you get a number of clients that come in and they, you know, they, they, they say, Hey, you know, David, I, I want to purchase a, a four unit property, a six unit property, what have you. I like, I want an income producing property for X, Y, Z reasons. Maybe it's for tax re tax reasons. It's to offset, you know, their current income, it's for retirement, whatever the reasons might be. And what you find after, you know, going through a discovery period with them is that, you know, they think they want, they think they want to be, you know, an active owner uh, in, in a, in a multi-unit property. But what you come to find out is that maybe they just didn't know all the options that were available to them. And that it really, at the end of the day, they would be much better suited for a, you know, limited partner position and, and a more passive, um, you know, investment opportunity, like a syndication. So can you maybe speak to more to that? Yeah, I mean, you gave a great summary. The reality is a lot of people come into my world because they want to buy that small scale multi. And mm -hmm. when I reference small scale, I'm referring to anything roughly under $5 million all the way down to like your typical fourplex. Mm -hmm. And so they come into my world because they want to buy that type of product. And they think that, that they, they like the idea of multifamily. They understand the benefits of multifamily uh, over maybe a single family property but they aren't really aware of any other alternatives. They think that's really the option, buy a house or buy a small apartment building if they wanna be in residential, right? And so uh, as we get into that conversation, and luckily I, uh, you know, we have a great system for attracting that type of investor into our world. And so I get to be on calls with investors, you know, dozens uh, per month. And in those conversations, inevitably we get to a point where I say, listen, I have a, a few different types of investors. I have our active investors, the ones that love to manage real estate, they love to get their hands dirty. They love to dig into the numbers and finding deals and trying to get creative and managing managers and dealing with tenants. And they don't mind that. They love that idea and they love building up their own small portfolio. Those are my active investors. Then I have on the other end of the spectrum are people that are busy, high income earning, busy professionals, entrepreneurs, small business owners who really don't have any interest in owning the real estate. They just want all the benefits of owning the real estate, mm -hmm. the cash flow, the appreciation, the depreciation, etc. And then we, of course, have a blend of both where some want to own their own stuff and they also recognize that they would rather just invest their money with someone else and get a return. And once we have that conversation, I realized when I started to have that conversation with people that a significant portion of my investor database had zero interest in actually physically owning and managing the property. <laughs> and that was the aha moment for me where I needed to explore alternative options to help those investors um, get involved in real estate and enjoy the benefits of real estate without actually having to buy their own fourplex or eightplex or 12plex. Is what you found is that most of them didn't even realize that there was another option available. Is that what it really came down to? I, I actually was less familiar with the options myself. Like, I mean, even yeah. being in the real estate world, like it's surprising. I think as you, you've been in this business for so long and so many that are in the business forget there's so many people out in the world that don't even know about private equity. They don't know about syndications. They don't mm -hmm. know about passive investing. They think they got to go throw their money in, in a REIT if they want to invest in real estate passively, right? Yeah. So um, I was unaware. And then that's when I really started my journey of learning about syndication, uh, uh, partnering or finding uh, partners in other parts of the country that could provide some benefit that my investors wanted that w I couldn't really provide to them here in Utah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that's where I learned about syndication and then dove headlong in.
Got it. Got it. So let's talk about the investment side of your, of your business, you know, the syndications, uh, you know, you're looking at, you're, you're taking on much larger assets than these smaller, you know, four, six, eight unit properties, or you know, I guess you said 5 million and less is kind of what your ideal client is that comes through the right. brokerage firm. And so talk to me about, you know, the types of deals you guys are looking for, the markets that you're looking in and um, just general overview, if you would. Yeah. Well, uh, initially, um, I had a lot of my investors that would say, hey, look, I, you know, I, I'd like to participate in more cash flow than what Utah can provide. So even if we were able to find them a small commercial building, like it was, it was challenging to produce any real significant level of cash flow here in Utah. Mm -hmm. And so what my initial plan was is I'm going to go out and find opportunity in the Midwest. Uh, where I could find better cash flowing opportunities, more stabilized market versus a growth market like we have here in, in Salt Lake and um, and be able to provide them a better blend of both cash flow mm -hmm. and appreciation. And so I actually pulled my investors. I sent an email out to them all to the whole, whole database and said, hey, would you be interested in this type of deal? And that was a deal in the Midwest. It was 100 units or more. I gave some general uh, expectations as far as cash flow and appreciation and potential exit. And I had a very large majority of them ha express interest in that. And so that's what I set out to do was to find operators. So there's there was some specific criteria I was looking for. Number one, I was looking for a deal in the Midwest um, in a few select markets, Kansas City being one of those, um, Indianapolis being another. Um, go ahead. You look like you had a question there. Kevin. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Okay. And uh, so I set out to say, look, I don't have any expertise in those markets. I think anybody trying to come into my market and beat me is going to have a hard time doing that. So instead of me trying to go into those markets and find the, the real opportunities, let's go and partner with someone that's boots on the ground in that market. So that's what I set out to do. I wanted to find uh, first and foremost for me outside of those, you know, markets that I was looking for was an operator who had experience, who had a track record of success, was boots on the ground in the market that they were investing in and were values aligned with me. Simply, I wanted to get to know them to a level that I felt like they would treat my investors the same way I wanted them to be treated as well. Mm -hmm. And once I found a few partners that I felt like fit that criteria, oh, and last was I wanted them to be on a growth trajectory. I wanted them to be actively seeking deals versus maybe someone that had already you know, built up a very substantial portfolio and were sort of sitting back and enjoying what they had built. I wanted someone that was very aggressive and out mm -hmm. there looking for opportunity. So once I found a few operators that uh, fit that criteria, uh, I made it very clear to them what I was looking to do and I wanted to partner with them and I wanted to learn from them and get involved in an opportunity. And as part of that, bring part of my investor network into the deal and ultimately partnered with a great uh, operator team out of uh, the Kansas City market. And we ended up acquiring a 164 unit uh, C-class deep value add deal uh, in Kansas City. Got it. Got it. Let's talk about vetting the sponsors as you went on that, that mission to find, um, you know, the sponsors that were, you know, that, that kind of met all your, you know, they, they checked all the boxes on your list. Um, what did that vetting process look like? How were you able to kind of filter out the good from the bad? Yeah. So the vetting process, I believe sort of gets cut into two categories. The first is sort of the checkbox category, mm -hmm. which is I wanted someone that a, like I mentioned, boots on the ground, they needed to be living in the market that they were investing in. Not critical for me today, but on that first deal and the first few deals uh, was critical. So investing in that local market two, uh, they needed to have a track record of success. So for me, that meant a thousand units that they had acquired okay. and ideally at least three deals. And then number three was um, they needed to be on a growth trajectory, meaning, you know, they were still actively, you know, uh, pur purchasing assets. So that was the sort of checkbox, right? And they obviously they needed to be able to, I needed to do a background check on them. They didn't, uh, they needed to make sure that there weren't any, you know, lawsuits against them or bankruptcies or anything mm -hmm. like that, that, you know, the high level stuff that I just wanted to make sure that they hadn't had in their past. Aside from that, then it's sort of this, this, there's no checkbox. It's getting to know people. Yeah. And that's the hardest part of vetting an operator. If you don't already have a personal relationship with that person, it just takes time. And so it meant I had to, with this particular operator, I knew 18 months in advance of doing a deal with them. And we had many conversations. We did some coaching together. We, uh, I w flew out to Kansas City, met with him and his team, had lunch with them, uh, got to know them. And ultimately, that part is probably the most time consuming and the most difficult because it, it just takes time. 
and we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. So uh, some high level, you know, uh, items as it relates to vetting an operator. Yeah, no, I, and I appreciate that. And s switching gears here, you know, you, you've got a unique perspective in that, like you're, 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 you're dealing with uh, you know, the investment side of things, but you've also got, uh, you got your, 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 your finger on the pulse uh, of small, medium, large. I mean, just all perspectives of real estate. Um, you're also very well versed in the, in the retail side of things as well. And so, you know, there's, there's a good bit of chatter going around, uh, you know, in the headlines of, of doom and gloom, just, we've got a lot of interest rate volatility. And so what are you seeing, uh, you know, firsthand uh, ground level, what are you seeing, uh, I guess on multiple different levels, are you seeing um, any pullback from, from any of your investors, as far as their interest in, in putting money to work at present time, just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. Have you seen the adjustment in pricing uh, on assets that are you know coming to the market? Um, and I'll, I've got another question after that, but I'm gonna leave it at those two at present. Let you answer those first before I give you too many overload. Yeah. So, so let's start with pullback from investors. Yeah. There's no question. You know, a lot of people want to sugarcoat it and say, Oh, you know, you know, this is a great opportunity, a great time to get in that type of thing. Just cause anytime there's uncertainty, there's opportunity and there's truth to that. The reality mm -hmm. is investors, there's no question that my experience has been that there's been investor pullback. Now, um, I do believe that it's more of like a cooling off. I do believe that investors are mm -hmm. like, wait, what's going on in the market here? I, there's just uncertainty and that causes people to sort of stall in place. It doesn't yeah. mean that they're not investors moving forward. It just simply means that everybody was like, oh, taking a deep breath and trying to figure out what was going to happen in the future. And to, to a certain degree, that's still taking place today. So uh, yes, I've seen investor pullback, the amount of equity that was flowing into our deals uh, definitely, uh, contracted. And, uh, I believe that there's still a lot of equity that is just sort of sitting on the sidelines waiting for a place to go once mm -hmm. we can get some certainty moving forward. So that's my take of what's going on from an investor standpoint. Um, and I, I'll speak to the investors uh, from an investor standpoint on small scale multi as well. And that is, um, there's, there's, unfortunately, there's just this disconnect between the sellers and the buyers today. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and the lenders for that matter. So sellers are still of the impression that, Hey, you know what, you know, this price point that I thought I was able to going to get, uh, you know, four months ago, three months ago, uh, I still feel like I should be able to get that. And buyers and lenders of course are saying, no, that's not the case. And so there's a bit of a, a, a standoff happening in my opinion. Um, and I think sellers are starting to crack a little bit. And it's really those opportunistic sellers who bought at a great time, have an incredible amount of equity built up and are ultimately saying, yeah, I'm probably going to take a haircut off of what I could have gotten, but it's still a phenomenal return. And maybe it makes sense for us to either recapitalize and go after something else and seek out other opportunities, or maybe it's hunkered down uh, on a, you know, an opportunistic time to sell. But um, those are my those are my the, the sense of what's going on in the market right now. How do you help an investor that that owns you know might have bought right? They've got a few assets and um, you know, they've got a good bit of equity, even even though things have cooled down just a little bit, maybe from what they were four months ago. You know the you know the concern I think a lot of small investors have is like, well, if I sell today at a premium, I I need to I basically need to take that capital and put it somewhere else, and ultimately I'm going to be buying at a premium as well. And so how do you overcome that argument or I guess that that concern? Yeah, it, on, it comes down to motivation of the seller and you yeah. make such a great point. That's ultimately the biggest challenge I face right now today, which is, all right, you know, David, yeah, I love the idea of selling. In fact, even with the market, you know, maybe drop it, I'd be willing to take a haircut, but what am I going to go into? Mm -hmm. And that's our challenge. And so it's really about finding opportunity uh, on the other end, on the, on the up leg of a sale. Yep. And if we can find that opportunity for our local investors, then we can make deals happen. Um, outside of that, then it comes down to external motivations. Mm -hmm. Something's going on in their world that's causing them to want to sell right now. But aside from any distress, you know, eliminating distress from the equation, it really comes down to what am I going to go into? Yep. And can I find something equivalent mm -hmm. or better to move into? Yeah. Which is a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I would add a, a third, which is maybe not distress, yeah. but they're to a place in life where they're ready to take a little bit more of a backseat and they aren't uh, interested in being as active as they once were. 
Mm -hmm. And that investor could then exchange into something like, you know, a triple net lease or maybe a newer vintage product that would require less maintenance and, and management than an older yeah. vintage property would. David, for those that are that are listening in here that want to learn more about the different services that you offer, and, and again, you're both on the investment side as well as the brokerage side, where's the best place to track you down and get more details? Yeah, the best place is probably go to, to canovocapital.com. Mm -hmm. That's C A N O V O capital.com, canovocapital.com, or they can go to returnonequityreport.com. We have a very simple calculator that they can download to run a return on equity analysis. Many investors have built up a tremendous amount of equity over the last handful of years in their property. And this simple calculator will allow you in five minutes or less to plug in your numbers and understand what kind of return you're getting on the equity that's trapped in your property. And that'll help you make a decision of whether or not it makes sense to hunker down, to refinance or potentially exchange into something else. Oh, that's fantastic. Guys, we'll put that in the show notes. And then your podcast, they can find that on your website, I'm guessing, correct? That's correct. Yeah, the Lead Sponsor Podcast. Okay, fantastic. Guys, I was just on there as well. He does a great job on that show and it's got some amazing guests on there as well. And so with that, David, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's been a lot of fun having you. My pleasure, Kevin. Thanks for having me. All righty, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. You take care.